Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we still have some folks trickling in, so um, we are going to get started today. Hello, I'm Deborah Barkin. I'm creative director of the Berman Museum of Art at Ursinus College, and I want to welcome you to our final Berman conversation of the spring 2021 semester. Berman Conversations reflect the interdisciplinary nature of Ursinus College's liberal arts mission by pairing artists with faculty, staff, or students from across the curriculum. Tonight's conversation will be between artist Shannon Leah Colas and Ursinus student Kristen Cooney, who is co-curator along with Justin Mitchell and Katie Sandfield of the exhibition Shannon Colas Strata. And this is part of the Curatorial Practices Seminar, a capstone experience of Ursinus College's interdisciplinary museum studies minor. Kristen, Justin, and Katie worked with Shannon Colas, along with Dr. Megan Tierney and myself, to conceptualize and realize strata under the challenging circumstances of COVID-19. And I'm sure that Shannon and Kristen will address the, adra the adaptive processes necessary by these, that were necessitated by these very unique conditions. It is my great pleasure to introduce Shannon Leah Colas, an interdisciplinary artist who investigates relationships among multiple sensory modalities and between visual and acoustic phenomenon in perception. She creates audiovisual installations and interactive environments that highlight the situated embodied experience of hearing and seeing. Colas's work has been widely exhibited across North America and abroad, including solo exhibitions at the Arlington Art Center in Virginia, at Grizzly Grizzly in Philadelphia, and Open Studio Contemporary Printmaking Center in Toronto. Other collaborations and screenings include projects at the Murray Art Museum Albury in Australia, the Walters Art Museum and the Institute for Contemporary Art, in Baltimore, as well as the current New Media Festival in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She has received numerous individual and project grants from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Maryland State Arts Council, and her work is included in public uh, collections in Europe and across North America. Colas is a 2005 graduate of the Master of Fine Arts program at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada, and she is currently Associate Professor at the University of Maryland, where she teaches digital media and sound. Colas is debuting her newest work, Strata, here at the, Muse at the Berman Museum of Art. And Strata is supported by a 2019 Ruby's Artist Grant, which is a program of the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation. Kristen Cooney is a junior at Ursinus College, double majoring in visual art and environmental studies with a museum studies minor. She creates art inspired by the natural world and has a passion for the outdoors and hiking. And we are so happy to have both of you here tonight in the Berman Museum Zoom Room for this conversation, which will be followed by a Q&A. Please type your questions into the chat function and please join me in welcoming Shannon Leah Colas and Kristen Cooney. Thanks for having me this evening um, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, the first thing that I uh, really wanted to do was to introduce the project briefly. Um, I wanted to show a few still images and videos because I know that um, many of you watching probably have not been able to see the exhibition. Um, I wanted also to talk a little bit about my approach to the work, um, so give it some background. And then Kristen and I will open it up to a more informal conversation. So I'll leave out some of the details first and save those for when we um, talk in a bit. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so generally I'm interested in how our sensory modalities give us access to the world and contribute to the meaning of an experience. Um, one thing that I really wanted to um, put forth that an important part of, part of my work really starts with um, field work, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but the site visit. Um, I often seek out experiences in very remote places. I look for the unexpected, um, I call it the unscripted because sometimes I don't know what will happen in these places. 
and also the uncomfortable. Um, I really want to position myself outside of my everyday life and put myself into an environment that is completely unfamiliar and isolated. And through these uh, site visits, I look for the complex intersection between human activity um, with strata in particular, um, where industrial projects um, and the natural world meet. Um, and in this work, I really ask the question, how can I use my own body um, and my own senses as a means of understanding not only the beauty and the richness of the landscape, um, but also how industry has been destructive. So I really wanna understand the ecological impl implications. Um, Strata, of course, and this is an image from the installation is my most recent project at the Berman, where I'm really trying to do this. I often use the word multi-sensory um, in terms of the exhibitions that I build, but I think about sight and sound. And it's where I use immersive video and sound to share, um, in this case, Strata, uh, the complex story of the oil extraction industry in Northern Alberta, Canada and its environmental effects. This is a photo that I actually took from a Cessna plane and I wanted to talk a little bit about the region. This is where oil is extracted from the vast petroleum deposits known as, as the Athabasca oil sands. So the bitumen is mined from the ground from these vast open pits as you can see from this photograph. Um, the effect on the landscape is really immense. Um, bitumen is a, a really thick and heavy oil, uh, and it's mixed with a lot of sand and minerals in a deposit that covers about 55,000 square miles of Northwest Alberta. And apparently that's like the size of Florida. Um, so it's quite large. Um, the tar sands production is a great energy cost. It's extremely carbon and water intensive. And it produces these toxic lakes, these tailings, waste ponds that threaten one of the world's largest watersheds. Um, so there's more broad awareness of the damage of the industry, um, what it does to the boreal forest, the wildlife, and really the threat that it continues to pose to the First Nations communities in Northern Alberta. So in, in my work, I'm really interested in our sort of um, complex relationship to where we live. Uh, I want to understand um, how fundamentally as, as humans, we, we relate to the world that we live in. So um, I think of these ways of finding um, sort of alternative ways of environmental knowing. I use technology as a tool, um, but I really use that technology for uh, ways of embodiment and a connection to the land that surrounds us. And also a way that technology is the way to share it. Strata, this is an installation shot from the exhibition. It allows visitors to travel, I say above and alongside because I'm flying and I'm also traveling along these various sites surrounding the oil sands. For example, two of the biggest plants I visited, Suncor and Sincrude. I traveled above the Athabasca River, uh, the tailings ponds, the, bo the boreal forest, even the reclamation sites. The final installation, as you see here, uh, uses large scale video projections and they're mapped onto various size, um, kind of like planar walls and as well as four channels around sound. So the audio really um, permeates the exhibition space and, and provides an immersive experience for the audience. So what I'm gonna do uh, next is I'm gonna play two short video excerpts from the exhibition. One is from the main gallery upstairs and the second is a three screen uh, continuous video piece. Um, I know that video on Zoom is not ideal, um, but I did want you as an audience right now to get a sense of the work.
So I just wanted to note that the last video is part of the exhibition Strata, and it occupies the corridor walking into the main upper gallery. Um, it's a three channel digital video displayed on LED screens with the really subtle sound of, of air um, from the plane. Um, and it's constructed of, of still images seen together meticulously, including my own photographs from the Cessna flight, satellite images and drawing. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the process of making. Um, and these are two images from my documentation process, um, driving in these remote areas and also flying. Uh, the project was carried out in stages, first a visit to the region during which I gathered audio and video source material from various sites. Um, and in getting there, and this is the unscripted part, there were a lot of site visit restrictions and no fly zones. So despite this, I was able to secure a way of capturing video uh, footage. I booked a flight uh, in a fixed wing Cessna through Fort McMurray Aviation. And this really was um, a really big part of, of my uh, trip there and allowed for a bird's eye view of two of the largest uh, mining projects in the area. And that's where that first photograph came from that you saw. Um, and the footage collected on site became the source material for the installation. My goal, and it's always my goal to sort of create a full body uh, sensory experience um, using multiple projectors. Um, videos, I'd like to think really engulf the walls and they fill uh, the exhibition space from floor to ceiling. And I, my intention is really for the sound to reverberate throughout the room and as if generated by the field of the moving image. So I really want to um, have the images and sound connect. Um, and viewers are, are welcome to enter and investigate this space and really let the experience overwhelm them. My explorations, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how they are guided. And this is in part by the composer and musician, Paulina Liberos. She has the philosophy of deep listening. And uh, in a directive, she writes, listening, listen to everything all the time and remind yourself when you are not listening, you are a part of the environment. So that comes from the poetics of environmental sound. And she instructs us to pay attention to the sounds around us and the complexities and differences of what we hear and how they affect us. And so I think about the, this way of listening as a way to lead us to a greater understanding of our relationship to the environment. So this photo to the left is from the Alpine Valley in Australia, and the right um, is Northern Alberta. And my work started this way when I was in Australia. I spent two, two weeks walking the valley, the landscape, and really mapping out the terrain through sound. Um, and that was a sound-centered residency. And I really think this was the impetus or the model for Strata. Um, I really love this idea of approaching my work in an unscripted and flexible way and I interact um, with the circumstances of the moment. I always use this guide um, as a way to uh, prompt for my research, um, especially when capturing, um, doing the, the field studies. Um, I use a variety of technologies to create my work, but I often start by putting down my equipment and just really listening and looking while deeply engaging with the environment present in these unique regions. I was trying to figure out how my practice relates to this complex environment. And I really try to orient uh, towards being a part of the place and not a visitor if that's possible. I always remind myself I'm creating and doing field work and I want to um, listen to everything uh, and really foreground this visual auditory cross-modal approach to research through my body and my senses. Um, so that's my short introduction um, to Strata. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that um, Kristen and I can discuss further. Thank you for all of that, Shannon. That's a really awesome introduction. There's some things in there that even I haven't seen after working on this for like a year now. <laughs> so as my first question, I'm super interested in the personal connection aspect of it, because I know you spent a lot of time there. You lived in that area for a long time. So how does that sort of change the project for you? Because you also worked in different bioregions like in Australia doing sort of similar projects, but not exactly the same? That's a, a great question. Um, my personal connection, of course, as you mentioned, is that I grew up in Alberta. Um, just a little bit of background that I moved um, to Fort McMurray uh, after I finished grad school um, to go teach in a small college there. I went to teach printmaking, and this was 15 minutes from um, one of the biggest plants. Um, my, my perception there, um, and this was 15 years ago, it was a, a boom town um, and several oil companies uh, really had uh, doubled 
um, and scale. And there was a lot of families and individuals coming from all over Canada to be there. So I was really witnessing it first um, person. And that sort of spoke of, of just how large this, this thing was. So the difference is actually being there and witnessing it. And that um, really happened for me physically. Uh, early on, you know, 15 years ago, you could get closer to the site. So um, the area was really beautiful and I loved to run and drive. And I discovered the oil sands on one of those explorations. So um, when I had this moment of, of physically being there, the scale um, of the destruction, I was kind of on the edge of this open pit and I could see into the horizon. Um, I, it, it just really struck me because it was in my own backyard. So that's the difference is, is the connection, um, the history, um, how personal it was because it was so close to where I grew up, um, just even in working and living there, but knowing how close it was. Um, so that really struck me. And 15 years later, here's here's the work. <laughs> yeah, that's really wonderful. It's, I think it's really cool that you like to get outdoors and run. Um, I'm personally, I like to hike a lot. So that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from as an artist, too. Um, and you touched a little bit on this already, but you mentioned that there was sort of a boom in surveillance that coincided with the the oil sands being mined and things like that. Can you kind of talk about that experience when you were trying to get footage and kind of getting barriered off by those people? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of um, protection of the sites and, and part of the reason is <laughs> for people like me um, coming there um, to um, perhaps uh, share some of this terrifying, uh, the nature of what's happening. I think the security comes from just um, the, the state of the world now. So um, 15 years ago, um, the protections weren't there. Um, people weren't flying drones, um, you know, any sort of um, traffic up there, really the airport was quite small. So there wasn't the threat of, of others uh, sort of populating the space and the curiosity there. Um, they used to do even tours um, and those had been canceled, uh, I think in part because of the pandemic. Um, but there is, um, I just felt a barrier the whole time. And I feel like that is somewhat represented um, in the exhibition in a way that I felt like I was always um, looking through windows of the plane or I was looking through the window of my car. I was no longer um, able to sort of run up next to this space and really kind of sit on it or with it. Um, and feel it that way. Um, but the, the Cessna flight for me was uh, really eye-opening in that, in that um, I was able to be on top of it and really experience um, the scale in a different way. And, and that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't um, run into those restrictions. I don't think I would have gone that far. Yeah, that whole dynamic is really interesting to me. And I also think uh, it's really cool that you got to work with a, a Cessna pilot and could you talk a bit about getting that bird's eye view for the first time? Like, cause you lived there for a while and you didn't necessarily get that view. Like, did that shift your perspective in the vastness of that region? Absolutely. I think if I come back to the Paulina Leveros example, when you're listening and looking with your body, um, you're really restricted to how you occupy, occupy that physical space. And so when I did um, go to Fort McMurray Aviation, um, the pilot was so kind. He was <laughs> very um, open to working with me as an artist in terms of um, where I wanted to fly um, and, and sort of my strategy of what I wanted to capture. Um, lifting up into the air that way in such a small aircraft is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I, it was a very windy day. Um, and I, you know, I think I left my fingerprints on the handle of the door. I was <laughs> very nervous. Um, but the, the scale, that bird's eye view um, is uh, something that I could just never have experienced on my own. Um, we have these technologies like drone cinematography, but my body was up there experiencing it. So it did have that, that closeness that I talk about, that experiential sensory um, sort of feel, um, even though I'm not on the ground. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think it's funny that you say that. So I get the sense that the uh, Cessna planes, they're like smaller as like the smallest kinds of planes. OK, that's <laughs> interesting. Um, not to derail the conversation too much. Yeah. But could you talk about how you came up with the name for Strata 2? I know it has sort of like a geologic sort of nuance to it and plays with the idea of layers as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the starting point for the name is the geology or the, this idea of the layer um, or series of layers and rocks. Um, I really picture the industry, um, namely like the style of mining or the mining style operation where you have these wide expanses of earth kind of being scraped and stripped over time. So I think of that as strata. Um, I also like the um, sort of implications of spatial and time-based metaphors. So this idea of layering over time um, and how those things are changing and connecting um, and how that could be a record of past processes. So even just thinking about what um, the oil sands might look like hundreds of years from now, will it be reclaimed? Will that history be underneath? Um, I, I, the one I think strongest connection for me too um, is in my working process. So um, I think we've had a conversation before that um, my background is in sort of more traditional physical making. I'm a printmaker sort of first and foremost, and I really um, work in layers. And so I, I think it's evident in the imagery <laughs> and also the sound. And so this idea of, of strata is, is this layering and continuous layering of imagery to kind of get to a, a feel um, a tone of, of what I experienced through, in a, a way, abstraction in that sense. Yeah, definitely. So um, on a similar note there is sort of, you work in sort of a multi-sensory mode. Was that intuitive and did that kind of come naturally to you? And has that always been a way you like felt inclined to work, I guess? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, one thing, one sort of shift in my work that um, happened was in uh, kind of going back, um, I went back to school and, and uh, what a field then was called computation arts. And I remember stumbling into the um, recording studio and really uh, starting to understand the power of sound. Um, and that's where I learned how to mix and, and use sound, but I never made a connection uh, between my material practice and the sonic stuff I was doing. And really until um, I feel when I'm thinking about the multi-sensory uh, stuff, um, I feel like when I was in Australia, that's where they really seamlessly came together. Um, in thinking about um, just when you're completely isolated in an environment and you pause and you stop to listen, um, the power of that sense. <laughs> you don't think about that because you're so um, visually kind of um, taken aback. Um, but the, the quietness allows you, again, as Polina Oliveros would say, to um, really allow that layering of sound to come in. So um, after that trip, um, I really feel like the connection became a lot stronger. Um, I always thought about these senses maybe perhaps separately. Um, there was the physical making, um, and then there was the working on the sound. And I feel like that's where they, they really started to meet. Okay, so I guess the sense I'm getting is a lot of it is experimenting and kind of like building your own path as far as your work. Okay, so in terms of that, do you work with people from all sorts of disciplines? Because I, I get you work with pilots. Do you also speak with like environmental groups or you also mentioned First Nations people and things like that. Do you ever get a chance to like, kind of talk to those people and see what they have to say or how they think about the situation? Yeah, I'd like uh, the idea of, of um, cross-disciplinary work and, and especially with this work is working and understanding other people's perspectives. And um, so for me, it, it's um, a lot of informal communication in that way, um, especially in terms of my research. Um, just in the making of the piece, um, for instance, um, working with um, the pilot is interesting. Um, so this idea of, of, of not working as a, an artist, an individual artist, but um, sort of um, coming together as a collaborator with someone that doesn't necessarily understand the practice and trying to communicate um, what I want visually <laughs> is, is interesting. But um, I feel like it's, uh, you know, one thing that happened that we, um, we can talk a little bit more about is this, uh, how everything shifted because of the pandemic. Uh, and suddenly um, my field work was uh, canceled, basically, I had to travel back 
home and, and then really rely on um, collaborators or people that I could work with um, from afar, so remotely. Um, and what that meant was communicating with, um, you know, other people in different fields. Um, I did a lot of calling and listening to people's stories. I still have friends um, from uh, the region that could tell me more about their experiences that way. So, so this sort of remote, um, you know, of course, my practice has a lot to do with being there physically, but um, learning a lot what uh, research could be um, from afar and, and really building these different kinds of collaborations in that way. Yeah, that's a really cool way to put it as collaboration. Um, and in the same sort of subject matter, did you, so you talked with lots of people, was there any like cold calling kind of involved? Like, did you have to like research, like this organization is close, maybe they have footage or something like that? Definitely. I mean, I, I did some, uh, you know, when I was there for the first time, of course, I had met um, the pilot uh, and that connection there. So he actually went up uh, after I had kind of planned out a map for him. <laughs> he went up and, and gathered more footage for me. So that was one connection that I formed there. Um, the other um, part of it was actually just reaching out to people in, in the manner of, of cold calling. Uh, in, most people were quite open and curious. Um, and I never, I never had a no response if, if it was something that was that I, they couldn't help me, but um, very friendly and, and curious about um, the work that I was doing, which was quite different from um, the more uh, sort of practical ways of, of using um, some of these planes and, and things like that. Um, and again, I think having conversations, um, you form communities of people through um, these educational institutions that you work with. And so th these 15 year old um, friends that could tell the story um, of Fort McMurray, especially and how much it's changed. Um, when I went back 15 years later, the city is quite different in how expansive it is um, because of the industry, um, but just the stories of, of still living there. Um, and, and what it's like now. Okay, that's cool. So it seems like a lot of other people were involved that maybe initially that wasn't the plan. Um, and can you speak then to the pandemic and like what that meant for you? Did Strata completely change or is it still kind of close to how you imagined it? It's an interesting question. And I ask myself that all the time. Um, you know, when, uh, when my field research was um, canceled. I think I was I was so defeated. I had planned to spend almost another week there, um, and uh, possibly a second trip in the summer. And the process of learning this landscape, as you know, takes time. And so the initial sort of response was uh, the, maybe perhaps that I couldn't complete the work. Um, and then through these explorations that you talk of the calling, the um, this idea of, of perhaps collecting footage from afar um, really kind of sparked the motivation to continue. Um, and it really opened up. I, I don't think the project would, would definitely not be the same. I also think about um, the final presentation of the work, and you, you could speak to this as well, but um, you know, setting up an exhibition that's meant to be immersive, but a very limited num number of people can actually see it. Um, and just installing it in a way when you have a, curator a curatorial team of students whom um, really wanted and needed to be there in person and, and trying to figure out ways um, remotely to still make that happen. So everything shifted and was a different challenge. Um, so I do think the work is unique because of that. Um, I feel so lucky to um, have been able to install the work, to work with you um, as a team. Um, and I also think of the work as being iterative. So could I still build on the work and, and go back and visit and, and perhaps another site visit? Uh, and does this work have a life after? Um, uh, the vermin in that way. But I feel like uh, what made it rich and what made it the story of what it is now is, is all of the circumstances that happened. So I, again, I feel very lucky to have been able to install the work. That's really interesting way to put it. Um, and to switch gears a little bit, uh, it's hard for me not to pull the nature part into it because I'm an environmental studies major as well. But can you talk about uh, specific experiences with nature? Like, is that a big inspiration for you? And you know, are there particular wildlife species or 
I know you talked about the trees and the enormity of them and how that also inspires you. If you could just expand right. on that, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I know, I think, Chris, um, Chris in, in our um, conversations, um, in the interview that we did before was just this connection to nature that I've had since I've been young. And part of that is in this region of Alberta, Canada and British Columbia, um, Canadians have this, this sort of um, statement that uh, there are these places. And I, I see that here now where you can land, um, especially in Northern Alberta and think that you are the first person to actually meet <laughs> this natural place. Um, so it's very um, rich and isolated. And um, growing up, uh, we were outside all the time camping um, in the Rocky Mountains and things like that. So I, I think it's embedded in me um, from when I was young. The thing about um, nature in that region um, that I think is really interesting that I think comes through perhaps in the work are the contrasts and the contradictions. So that's it's a rich um, biodiversity in that area. So the region is really beautiful. Um, the boreal forest, as you're coming in on a plane, it's like it drops you right in the middle. Um, and all of the forest species, like the spruces and the pines and um, the habitat there is, is just wonderful and complex. Um, but the, the contrast is um, sort of the, how the mining operation has really visibly transformed the landscape. And so you're surrounded by this inherent beauty and then it, it really um, locks right up next to, um, you know, some of this devastation. And so I, I wanted to, capture that in the work there's a state of rapid development and then there's the slowness so it's quiet and it's dramatic and and I I felt it very extremely those contrasts there um, because of those extremes um, so you know the beauty of the landscape uh, is really moving and so is the immensity of the industry so since you've talked with so many people surrounding this um, situation do you get the sense that like most people in that community or in Canada are aware of what's happening there and are there kind of strong reactions to what's going on like has that awareness increased in recent years? Yeah I think um, in Alberta it's definitely um, you know in the news I think everyone it's no secret um, that Alberta's oil sands are an especially uh, dirty source of crude oil um, and I think at least many um, people in the community that I know are very keen on reducing you know, the amount of oil that's being um, extracted. Um, the irony there is that um, many politicians, including Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, um, have long supported the pipeline. So sort of he's trying to balance this uh, priority to fight climate change, which Canada is sometimes known for, um, but also supports the energy industry. So I know we've had this conversation too about how complex um, the issue is um, in the sense that it's critical to the economy, uh, but then it also poses a direct threat um, to these indigenous communities, um, especially to the water, uh, the Athabasca River, this critical resource. So um, it's, it's complex and the politics are very probably similar here. Um, even with the cancellation of the XL pipeline, there are still pipelines, you know, continuously being built. So, um, so I guess the question is, is sort of what is the um, future of energy in a, in a way to, is it about shifting to low carbon, carbon free, renewable resources? Um, and I think the complexity is how does that happen in a way? Um, uh, the politics are always, always moving and changing. And so um, uh, people are very concerned in Canada, but um, it's just a matter of, of what's, what's next. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's crazy because you would think, oh, there's something happening in Alberta. It's not really affecting me here in Pennsylvania, but that pipeline does, I believe, cross over into the U.S. And like you were talking about, um, the cancellation of it and stuff. And it's it's crazy, again, the enormity of all of that and kind of how you play with that in Strata. Um, and to switch gears a little bit, um, because so I'm a photographer and I love kind of taking pictures of wildlife and things like that. And I know you mentioned technology sometimes maybe as a barrier and kind of disrupts your experience in those places. Do you see it that way kind of as a barrier? Do you prefer sometimes to go out and just experience it and not like do field work or something like that? Yeah, and I think that's why I bring up uh, kind of the exercise of listening. 
um, you know, the technology is, of course, my tool in terms of how I make the work. So it's a very important component. Um, and this is how I bring the story um, through the visuals and the sound. Um, but I have to kind of put that down first and, and feel it. Um, I think it's very important. Um, I don't want to um, sort of that to be my filter solely. <laughs> I, I, and I feel like this is why um, I, I was quite defeated at first when my field work was canceled because I think part of um, some of these site visits uh, is um, just uh, really getting in into the environment and, and feeling at one with it rather than always just looking through a lens. Uh, and so I have this um, dance with the technology that I use. I, I, I do need it and um, it's a part of the work, but I, I want it to fall away, even in the presentation of the work, that it's not about how, how was this made? <laughs> was it high tech? Um, it, it's just, um, do you still feel it like I felt it there? And so I use the technology as a tool, but I have to feel the landscape first. I get the idea. It's sort of like an organic process. So I, like there is planning involved, like getting um, with the Cessna pilot and getting up in the air to get some footage. Um, but sort of how much of it is organic? Like, is it kind of half and half? How do you kind of balance like making a stringent plan? Because as artists, you, it doesn't always work that way. And most of the time, the best things kind of come from, you know, organic experimentation. Absolutely. I think it's um, the, the richest experience is when it's a little bit of both. Um, I do a lot of research before I arrive um, to a place. And I think part of that is, um, just even the means of getting around and safety and um, a place of lodging and um, knowing the terrain a little bit um, and coming in with some of that knowledge. Um, of course, there's the research, the textual research and, and hearing um, about what this might be like. And then there's the difference of actually getting there. And, and a lot of times it's quite different. Um, and, and so it is very um, you know, it's based in, in that research, but then it becomes unscripted um, when I arrive. And I think the Cessna flight is a good example of that because it was an unexpected result um, because of some of these restrictions that I hadn't anticipated. Um, and so um, that moving flight was a matter of me saying, okay, well, um, how do I take the turn and still arrive at, um, at, at getting some of this footage. And so there's these risks and these unexpected turns. Um, the other thing that happened when I was there is um, it was very uh, cold. It was unexpectedly cold, which is cold for Canada and all of like my batteries were freezing and things like that. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, even just problems when we talk about the technologies and, and the tools that we're using. So you, you really have to be prepared um, for uh, anything uh, to happen, uh, but the, the research helps and, and it helps to guide you. Um, but it's definitely not like a, I think of a script or a musical score. And if you think about kind of a, a Cajun approach, John Cage, and, and you can interpret it and you can um, take artistic license with it. Um, so I have an idea of what I might do, but it's, it's very much like improvisational music in that way. Okay, that's that's really cool because I'm still kind of finding my way as an artist. Like, how do I approach things? What is my methodology? So, sort of hearing that you kind of balance those two. That's that's super helpful. And you mentioned sort of technological troubles. Like, I it's cool to me that we live in a time where, like, it's rapidly advancing as far as cameras and we have mirrorless cameras and all these crazy things coming out all the time. Um, but there's still barriers. And is there anything else you want to say? I know you said your batteries would freeze, but is there anything else that kind of is a barrier to you with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting working with technology and I'll compare it um, perhaps to making in a more traditional sense. So you, when I'm making a print, I always um, approach it in a more experimental way. Um, there's the resistance of the material. There's the chance that the ink won't come off the plate. And there's, so it takes a lot of, um, I use the word iteration again, um, but all of these um, kinds of loops, feedback loops in order to get to um, the final work. 
And I think that is similar to using technology. So a lot of times there's this assumption that even the work in the gallery, you just press a button and it turns on. Um, and, and as you've experienced in the installation, that's definitely not the case. Um, and so using the technology, you have to learn it. It doesn't necessarily behave the way you think it will. Um, and it, again, it's just a tool, just like an etching needle or a press. Um, it, it helps you to make the work, but it, um, it also creates a challenge. And so um, the difference is not the material, it's the material resistance um, from the physical making is, is different, but I still feel that resistance. And there's still a lot of unexpected um, things that happen um, from first from something that should be uh, um, seamless in that way. Yeah, that's a really uh, interesting way to put it. I love that you compare uh, printmaking to it because it seems so different. Um, but to you, it's just kind of imbuing this mixture of all these things that you like or you have experience in to make you know to make strata. But I think we're getting ready to move into the Q&A session. Sure. So if people have questions, I know they could put them in the chat and I'll try and monitor that. Or Shannon, if you just, if you could see them too and you see ones that you'd like to answer, you can go for it as well. Sure. So I see one about what are you currently working, working on? on? If you're willing to share some of that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, I have two things, um, and I think that I'm at this um, interesting pause in the work, um, and the work happens where you move into a piece, and you finish it, and then you have a, a kind of time for thinking. Um, two uh, projects that I'm thinking of um, making uh, is um, actually planning or kind of brainstorming a trip back to Canada to the to the Rocky Mountains where a similar kind of industrial thing is happening with strip mining there. Um, but I'm thinking about more of a sound based project and and what happens when I take away um, the image. And so I'm I'm thinking about a challenge in that way. Um, another project in online or in mind is um, I work with a, a collaborator as well. I have a duo practice. Um, with an artist, Liz Donadio, and we're talking about um, coming together in the summer because we're both educators and teachers when we're really busy and, and kind of thinking about um, our next project. Um, so really in the brainstorming stage right now for me, for sure. That's really cool. So what is it like working with another artist? Like kind of how do you balance who gets to pick what parts go in? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a good question. Um, I love having a collaborative practice. Um, it allows me um, to make work that just really extends from me, um, but join someone else in, in the making and the idea of making. Um, it's uh, this nice um, balance um, and back and forth. It's sort of like a dance. Um, and we both, uh, Liz and I, see very similarly in um, conceptual approach, but also in ways of making, but we have complementary skills. And so this idea, again, like the collaboration that happens from afar with people from other disciplines, it's similar in that way. We're both artists, but um, we really complement each other. Uh, so I love uh, having this, the individual practice, but also being able to make work. Um, I feel like it becomes more expansive in the same way that it, it did when I was visiting um, the area of Fort McMurray and working with other people in that. That's really cool that you uh, found someone where it, it kind of works out that it all fits together. Um, and before I forget, I just wanted to let everyone know that I do have a video that I made with Shannon. We had a little interview and it talks more about the uh, nature connections with strata. So I'll just stick a link in the chat for anyone who's interested in that. And we have a question from Linda too. So she asked, trying to get out to show it in a global scale, do you put it out there anywhere on social media or somehow get it to environmental issues as they're important? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And that's something that, especially with this work, um, I've been thinking about a lot and, and considering. And so um, I don't have a very big social media presence, but the one thing that I learned from this exhibition um, was really how the programming operated around it. And so suddenly when it wasn't about being there um, in person, 
um, to see the show, um, the museum studies um, team, <laughs> the class, um, talking about education and, and sharing the information, um, you know, whether it be social media platform or however that, that um, happens to kind of ebb out um, from this thing that is so localized. Um, and I really think uh, with this work, um, I, I think that it's the type of work that should have a voice outside of itself, um, especially in thinking, I think one of your questions that you asked me in the interview was, what does this have to do um, with, you know, a small town in Pennsylvania? And, and to really um, start to understand how um, we're connected as nations, um, as people, as societies, and, and all of these macro and micro connections, um, and thinking about how we live personally, our behaviors, um, you know, socially, um, and how that uh, ripples out. And so um, I intend to, I want to, and I'm not sure exactly what that is yet, but I would definitely love to show it again and uh, for that reason alone. Awesome. So we have another question from Jalen. So she's asking, continuing with the importance of sound inclusion in your work, what is the process of choosing specific tunes for pieces? Okay. I, I think that sound, uh, my approach to sound is very similar to my approach to imagery and its layering. And so the way that I work with sound is I bring a field recorder with me um, and I record the sounds that I hear um, <laughs> when I visit. And so um, a lot of the sounds that I recorded on this trip were um, related to flying um, you know, in the Cessna airplane, <laughs> um, but also some of the machinery just in driving and getting as close as possible. Uh, and then I work uh, with digital and analog synthesis and to create a kind of a soundscape or a bed um, to place these sounds. So it's a combination of, of both field recording. Um, and I don't want to use the word soundscape, but a, a way to kind of um, translate the feeling, the sonic feeling of being there, because sometimes that's not captured solely through the recordings themselves. So there's an, a lot of manipulation and layering. Um, and um, part of that is me with the digital and analog synthesis and how that's embedded in with the field recordings. The field recordings are like slowed down. Um, they're, you know, there's an essence of effects on some of it. Um, and that's for me to create, again, that tone um, of how it was there. Okay, thank you so much, Shannon, for answering all those questions. I think we're getting ready to wind things down. So Dr. Barkin, Shannon, or any anybody else wants to finish up with some comments, that'd be awesome. Well, I think that on this eve of Earth Day, this gives us so much visually and sonically and conceptually and in terms of process all of the strata that the two of you have talked, have, have spoken about during this conversation. Uh, we have a lot to take forward with us into our observances tomorrow and beyond. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Shannon Colas and you, Kristen Cooney, um, for giving us um, so much content this evening. I'd also like to thank Kristen's co-curators, Justin Mitchell and Katie Sanfield, and also Dr. Megan Tierney. And um, finally, also thank Sue Ragusa, who has been um, you know, running our tech all semester in our Zoom events since the pandemic. Um, we're, we're very grateful to you. And we're very grateful to you all for joining us this evening. I also invite you to check out the Berman Museum website and look at Shannon's exhibition online. There is a 3D model version that you can actually walk through online. And there are also links there to tremendous um, programming that Kristen and her co-curators have produced in conjunction with this exhibition um, from podcasts to video walks um, and to documentation. So um, please take some time to check that out. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and we hope to see you again at future events. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.